Hello. We're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, Demonics Microbrain, 3D Assay Ready Plates as a Human IPSC-Based Neural Spheroid Platform for High Throughput Drug Screening. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars, advancing scientific collaboration and learning. It's brought to you by Molecular Devices one of the world's leading providers of high-performance bioanalytical instrumentation, software, and consumables, and is dedicated to helping customers unravel the complexity of biological systems. Let's get started. You can pose questions to the speaker during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them into the drop-down box located on the far left of your screen labeled Ask a Question, and click on the Send button. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the window, click on the arrows at the top right-hand corner of the presentation window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by typing it into the Answer a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtaining your credits. I would like to introduce Grisha Chandy, Senior Production Manager, High Content Screening Solutions at Molecular Devices, and he will be moderating this session. Thank you very much. I wanted to just uh, do a quick uh, review of the agenda. Uh, I'll, I will uh, introduce the technologies used in the seminar today and host the Q&A uh, session at the end. Uh, our first speaker is Cassiano Caramu, uh, lead scientist at uh, Stemonix, who's going to uh, talk about the development of the 3D uh, human cortical spheroid platform for um, high homogeneity and functional uh, functionality for high throughput and high content screening. So he's going to talk about how he developed this, this, this tool. Then we're going to transition over to Oksana Sorenko, who is a, a senior research scientist here at Melika Devices, who's going to talk about the application of this micro brain 3D model to a high throughput, high content toxicity and calcium oscillation assay. So, I'm going to transition over and talk to you a little bit about the two, technolo the two or three technologies used in this uh, presentation. Uh, the first is talking about automated imaging. And you can do uh, imaging on a conventional microscope, and there's a manual process of putting your samples on the slide, putting a microscope, taking a picture, and then um, trying to figure out how to make measurements of that, of, of that picture, and that usually takes you hours. With the Image Express uh, system and high content screening, you can move those assays into multi wall plates or, or, or slides, but Multiple plates is what we're going to be talking about today. Put it into the system, acquire a variety of uh, data types, uh, automatically turn those images into numbers, and then uh, try to make sense of the data you've collected. And that workflow takes minutes rather than hours. The complete solution for automated imaging is to acquire those data, those images convert those images into something that can be segmented by, uh, automatically by software, make these multi-parameter uh, measurements, and then make sense of that data or do curve fits. And so that's, that's the, the, the offering through molecular devices. The other technology that's being used uh, in today's talk is a high throughput kinetic screen. So you put your, your samples in plates, you put into uh, the flip-up system, you get, uh, you add compound, you get uh, tracings from all the wells at the same time, and you analyze that data and try to make sense of that data. Now, these two uh, uh, solutions have been combined with uh, the products from uh, Stemonix, where they are uh, uh, going to talk about their IPSC-derived microbrain, uh, 3D microbrain model. Uh, and that's, that's one example of it and a blow up of what it looks like inside. And I've taken the, that product and put it through a variety of technologies, including the Flipper and the Image Express Micro, which are these high throughput 
uh, screening devices. So on that note, I would like to turn uh, the presentation over to Cassiano, who can tell you about developing this 3D, uh, the, the, the 3D human cortical uh, platform. Thank you very much, Girisha, for the introduction, and thank you everyone online today for joining on online today. Uh, I'll be talking about our latest development, um, that's a 3D model, uh, court call, spheroids platform for high field pool and high content screening. So at the moment, uh, our expertise is in human IPS-derived neural and cardiac platforms. We focus on adapting this platform for high throughput screening and producing assay-ready uh, solutions to accelerate drug discovery. So basically, the customer receives the plate ready to go to the assay. The cells are already plated, uh, or in the case of the 3D, you have these steroids in suspension for these assays. I will be focusing my talk today on the neural platforms that you call microbrain, more specifically microbrain uh, 3D. So one of the main challenges in neuroscience uh, research and drug development is to find the best model to answer a question. Uh, this figure here summarizes the main models for neuroscience research. Uh, they vary from low complexity, such as uh, cellular models in vitro, to high complex but low throughput, such as animal models or uh, human po uh, post-mortem brains. Given the ethical barriers with the uh, animal models in vivo and uh, the scarce availability of post-mortem human brains, scientists have uh, relied mostly in vitro models such as uh, cellular models and organoids. With the advent of human pluripotent stem cells, uh, scientists now have access to any human tissue in vitro. Uh, the challenge, though, is to find models that recapitulate the key aspects of the tissue or the disease in vitro. Um, more recently, research has focused on the development of 3D models, which more closely resemble the human brain, for example. However, the, some challenges still persist, and uh, between these challenges for the 3D models, uh, the, the three main ones are, one, how reproducible the assay is, uh, two, how accurate it recapitulates uh, in vitro what you observe in vivo, and finally, how scalable this is. So, here is someone who decided to tackle this, this problem, uh, developing a new platform that's called uh, Microbrain 3D. So, one of the main features of the Microbrain 3D is that this is derived from a single donor IPS line. So, both um, uh, astrocytes in neurons that uh, compose this platform is derived from a single cell line. This platform is composed of a co-culture of a balanced uh, amount of astrocytes in neuron. You try to target one-to-one -one ratio of astrocytes in neuron, and they display key neuronal and astrocyte markers. We also observe spontaneous synchronized activity over time. It's, it's, it's a sign of maturity of the system and connectivity between these neurons. And finally, we develop a platform that's amenable for high content screening. So all the platforms that we offer right now are in the 384 well format. On the left here, you can observe one cross-section of this microbrain of one of these spheres and highlight the neurons in green as they stand for MAP2 and the astrocytes in red as they stand for GFAP. One of the first things that uh, we decide uh, when we started to, to derive a highly homogeneous platform was to derive platforms that are highly homogeneous in size. When we talk about the 3D, there is a lot of variability that's in the system, and one of the hardest to control is the size of the spheroids. So we, we, we tackle this problem offering a 3D4 well plate with one spheroid per well, and each spheroid is highly homogeneous in size between them. So uh, across the plate, there's a lot of consistency in size. Uh, the, the range uh, of these spheroids are uh, around 600 micrometers, so we're not too big, so there is no hypoxia observed in the center, uh, and they're not too small, so they can, we can recapitulate many of the features of the human brain. When we receive this uh, 3D4 well plate, we're able to culture for weeks. So here's just represented a snapshot of the whole 3D4 well plate. We capture this image using the Image uh, Express microconfocal from a molecular device. 
you can see one of these steroids uh, highlight on the on the right. On, on the bottom here is the maximum and minimum representation, the graph for the columns of the, the 3D4 wall. So there's 24 columns in the 3D4 wall plate, and you can see how compact is this distribution of the size of these spheroids. Of course, when we're talking about the 3D, also one of the main questions that you have it is how you can translate everything that, or all the assays that you have in 2D to 3D. So it's very easy to do common assays in 2D, like immune staining. Uh, but in 3D, add some complexities that a lot of resources are afraid of incorporating their pipeline. Um, we decided to tackle this problem uh, doing uh, and developing simple assays or translate simple assays to the 3D platform. So one of the first one was immune staining. So as is highlighted here, this is a common immune staining with 4% PFA uh, done in suspension. Uh, we use the Image Express microconfocal microscope to capture the image. So this is a Z stack, is a Z projection of a Z stack but all the stain was done in suspension without the use of any special reagents. It's just a regular immuno, a immuno reagents that we have in the lab. Uh, moreover, the capture of these images was also done in suspension, so we don't need to mobilize or cross-section these spheroids to capture some relevant in, uh, um, information from this platform. What I'm going to show now is a video of this, uh, this platform now, also captured for the Image Express Confoc, the time lapse of the calcium oscillation. In this video, you can observe the spontaneous calcium activity present in Microbrain 3D. It was captured using Image Express Microconfocal at 50 frames per second. Both images correspond to the same spheres, with the only difference between them being the color profile. This was done to better visualize this calcium oscillation that's happened. As you observe in the video, uh, you could see that uh, there was um, um, synchronous activity or synchronous oscillation of this spheroid over time. Um, when you measure the regions of interest of these spheroids, you can see that uh, several cell bodies in these spheroids present this, uh, uh, neuronal cell bodies present this activity of calcium oscillation. Moreover, they are synchronized over time. Uh, so there is a um, um, uh, synchronous signal of these calcium oscillations that's being captured in 3D. We decide to ask if instead of using um, a low throughput microscope like um, um, uh, Confocal that we're imaging one sphere at a time, if we could capture the oscillations that you observe in a more high throughput fashion and use this, uh, the flipper from molecular device. So using the flipper, now we can capture the oscillations of this calcium um, um, uh, that we observe in the 3D. In, in real time for the whole 3 to 4 wall play at the same time. Uh, here highlight uh, on the left is one well, and you can see the oscillation over time, so the change in fluorescence over time. This is recording made at 0 0.5 frames per second for 10 minutes, and you can see that from time to time you have this, uh, this oscillation. Moreover, when we investigate the whole plate, um, all the wells that have steroids, they present these activities, or these activities are very homogeneous between the different wells and between different plates. We decided to test if this activity correlates with electrophysiology. So we test, we plate some of these steroids on multi electrode arrays, and we obtain and observe um, a lot of these oscillations uh, happen on the multi electrode arrays as well. So this correlates with the number of oscillations that we measure on Flipper. So what we're observing in Flipper, when you see these oscillations happen on, on, the, on the calcium, what we're observing is this massive synchronized signal that uh, is going through the whole sphere. It means connectivity. Uh, we have a time of maturation that these signals start to happen in these spheres, but when they start, we are observing all across the whole plate, the 384, and moreover, very homogeneous between the different wells. Of course, if you're talking about neurons, you're talking about cells that respond to a lot of chemicals, especially neuromodulators. So we decided to test if what you have is this signal that we're observing in Flipper can be modulated with some unknown um, 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 neuronal modulators. Our culture is composed mainly of the glutamatergic and GABAergic uh, neurons. Uh, this is a cortical differentiation uh, towards this, uh, this cell phase. So 
On this first slide, and highlight some of the glutamatergic uh, modulators. So we have uh, glutamatergic agonists like the canic S, and the canic S you can observe that it increases the oscillation. What's, so what you're showing here in the bar graph, this is the peak frequency or the oscillations that you observe relative to the vague control uh, that you have. So 100% uh, means no change in the oscillation pattern, and less than 100% means that we're decreasing the number of oscillation or repressing that signal. Uh, more than 100% means that we're increasing the number of oscillation or, 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 or accelerating this oscillation pattern. And the KNAC has to just do just that, as is expected from one agonist of the glutamatergic system, but also start to repress after some time. We believe that at, at that point you start to reach excitotoxicity, so this, uh, the, stimulus, the stimulus of the KNAC has been too much, and instead of having a, a, a continuous acceleration, you have a red, uh, repression because you have an inducing excitotoxicity. Um, the, the same neuromodulation was observed with uh, glutamatergic antagonists. So we have uh, several classes of antagonists represented here, CNKX, NBKX, DNKX, and MK801. And all of them reduce these activity, reduce these oscillations in a dose-dependent manner. So more concentrated, uh, and more the reduction that you observe. Our systems also compose of the GABAergic neurons. So we decided to test if we can have also GABAergic regulation there. We test the GABA agonist Paclofen and Musimol. So these are, uh, are compounds that are going to potentiate the GABA system, that the inhibitor system. Once you are potentiate that, you are reducing the number of oscillations, and you are able to capture that also in a dose dependent manner. Uh, there is a lot of interest of our platform for seizure approach, so for, and we decide to test if in non seizures any compounds can induce some change in this platform. So we test the four amino pyridine and no uh, seizure any compound and also induce increase in oscillation uh, over a dose dependent, in a dose dependent manner as well. So, um, of course, many of, many of uh, our customers and the people that collaborate with us, they're not used to, the, to these uh, readings of, uh, uh, in the flipper, these are spontaneous readings in the flipper, especially in 3D. So they try to correlate uh, between multiple platforms. So you use here the Flipper the Image Express confocal and the multi electrode arrays to see if the changes that you observe in the platforms are similar. Uh, multi electrode arrays is now the standard for electrophysiology, and a lot of people understand quite easily what, uh, what are the changes there. So here uh, on the bottom you can see uh, vague control treated and forming paradigms that is the cesogenic compound. And you can see that there are clear changes in the profile and the pattern of activation of these neurons. But these changes are also observed on the flipper. So on the top here, we have the vague control, the same vague control versus the four amino periodite treated uh, wells. And you can see the change in pattern. So there is an increase in the frequency of these oscillations, similar to what we observe in multi electrode arrays. Finally, you also observe that in Image Express Confocal. So, Image Express now you're doing a high resolution imaging uh, time lapse of these uh, of these cultures using the Confocal microscopy. Uh, and one of the beauty of using Image Express uh, and the Flipper is that you can use back to back. In this particular experiment, uh, we use the same vague control that we measure in Flipper. Right after we measure the whole plate in Flipper, we can go to the Image Express and do a high resolution only of that spheroid that you have interest. For example, there is a, a modulation, a specific modulation that you have particular interest and you can record that using now the Image Express Confocal uh, to see these oscillations and to confirm the data. You have been, once you have this uh, powerful platform in house, you decide to use in several projects that get studied here. Uh, this is just to mention some of the example, uh, uh, some examples of how we are using in-house here. For example, for assay development and disease modeling, uh, using a, uh, especially for modeling and neurodevelopment disorders, we start to be rat hindering in-house. We also doing for drug discovery, we, are, we have a, a, a customer that we're doing with some drug discovery for epilepsy, um, uh, drug discovery uh, of a library of compounds that can modulate the nervous system. We also did recent uh, with a collaboration uh, high throughput screen of the low pack library that's a library of uh, 12, uh, 1280 compounds. 
um, and you find a very interesting heat and a lot of um, uh, um, um, reduced variability between the response from well trail from the replicate, so that was uh, a really nice. Uh, finally, we we're also using for safety for my college and uh, uh, Tux College. So I'm going to show one example of uh, 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 neurotoxic screening for uh, drug candidates to treat Zika infection. And uh, Oksana, following my presentation, I'm also going to show some examples of that of collaboration that's going really nice for molecular device uh, about uh, uh, environment toxins uh, and neurotoxic effects. So. Zika virus have been uh, in the media for some time. There was a lot of attraction worldwide, especially because of the consequence. So uh, it was causing, uh, especially in pregnant women, some birth for the fact um, it was a new virus identified uh, in the ways that the infection um, uh, in new locations. And especially in Brazil, it hit hard with a lot of uh, people getting fat. Uh, the, the vector there is endemic, so it, was, it spread really fast in Brazil. And although there was a lot of effort from the scientific community uh, to speed up the drug development, there were no current uh, vaccines that were available or effective medications for Zika virus. So one of the approaches that the scientists decided to take it is to repropose uh, drugs that are already FDA approved. So instead of starting the pipeline from zero and develop new compounds, let's screen the libraries of compounds that are already approved uh, by the FDA, so you can repropose these compounds and put to the clinic much faster than a new, new compound that you need to test for, for um, efficacy. Um, one of the problems, though, was to identify compounds that were not only approved but safe to use, especially in pregnant women. So this is a very particular case that if you are using a compound as prophylax to avoid any consequences of the Zika virus, we need to make sure that that compound is safe. So we need to make sure that it not induce any toxicity, especially in the central nervous system. So we decided to test that with the platform that we have in-house. The first test that we did was a tox profile, a cell viability profile of this. Um, we used uh, two different stages of our cell lines. We used a stage that was progenitor stage, uh, that we call here NPCs or neurospheres, and you use also a more mature stage that's for more mature neurons, and we call microbrain 2D and microbrain 3D. So we have the two platforms in 2D and 3D. You, we decide to test both of them to see how is the efficacy between the two platforms and how they differ. And there was a logical correlation between the two platforms, so uh, we're very pleased to observe that you can mimic the finds that you have in 3D, uh, in 2D, um, in the 3D environment, uh, especially if, uh, using uh, uh, techniques that are very common in the industry, especially for Tux College. Uh, the only difference between the two is that instead of using the cell titer glow pro mega for the 2D, you use the cell titer glow pro mega 3D for the 3D platform. Um, and you can use any plate reader to, to read this assay. In this case, you use the uh, Spectrum Act from molecular device to, to, to do these readings. Um, one thing that was very clear, it is there is a lot of compounds that induce toxicity, especially at high doses. So what you're seeing here is a heat map of the cell viability. And more gold means that less cell viability, more blue means 100% viability, so no change in the cell viability. And uh, in the, a range of concentration of five different concentrations of compounds, from 10 micromolars to 0 0.01 micromolars. And you can see that in the highest concentration, especially in the progenitor stage, that the NPCs and the neurospheres, there is a lot of toxicity of these compounds. Uh, not surprised, many of these compounds that are being reproposed to Zika, they were approved for cancer uh, treatment, and especially targeting the cell cycle of the, um, of the cells. And for progenitor stage, the cell cycle is really crucial to, uh, and important for, for that cell line. So that's why we believe that we observe so much toxicity at the progenitor stage, but not too much toxicity in more mature stage or if, when you have more post-mitotic neurons. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that if you're using this in pregnant women, you need to be aware that that can influence the fetus development as well. So you need to avoid this compound that's in, in too much toxicity at that stage. We decided to select some of the compounds that you consider safe, so the compounds that didn't induce uh, much toxicity to test in a functional level to see if you, even though they don't have a cell viability drop, if they induce any uh, functional change on this, uh, on this cell lines. We again use uh, both platforms, microbrain 2D and microbrain 3D, but now we use the flipper tetra again. So 
uh, is a more high-throughput screening of these uh, compounds. Uh, the difference between the 2D and 3D, the way that we do, is that usually when we use the microbrain 2D, you are induced a response to glutamatergic agonists. So you, you, you induce that artificial response with, uh, the uh, with the compounds that will stimulate the cells. In this case, you are using the glutamate itself or the KNAC S. And what one observes is that on that stimulation, when you hit with the compound, uh, compounds at uh, after the pretreatment with these compounds that were considered safe in the cell viability, if they induce any change from the control or the vague treated cells. And we did observe three compounds that did induce some change, in fact, on this. So they were, although they did induce too much cell toxicity, they did induce a functional toxicity that could be observed on the flipper. Moreover, when we test on the microbrain 3D, because the microbrain 3D has this spontaneous signal, we don't need to induce that response. So what we're doing here is just measuring the spontaneous signal that uh, we observe. And we pre-treated these compounds to measure if there is any interference of that. Uh, surprisingly, um, um, we did find similar results uh, from, the, from the 2D, but we also found that there is a couple of compounds that did induce change in the peak frequency or in the frequency of that peaks uh, compared to, um, to the microbrain 2D that could not capture that difference. So in basically microbrain 2D, with the induced the response, we didn't capture change that could observe the microbrain 3D with the spontaneous oscillation. So there was a couple of compounds, especially the ones highlighted here, pyrimetamine and the palonosetron, you can see that to the highest concentrations, there is a uh, changes in, in the considerable change to the control uh, compared uh, compare to the controls. Uh, and while in the micro microbrain 2, the induced response you didn't observe that. Moreover, uh, you also found compounds that were relatively safe, like Enricasan, that's one of it was highly coded for treatment of Zika virus. Finally, you decide to see if you can measure this, this, uh, this difference that you observe on the 3D, on uh, microbrain 3D using the flipper, are also captured in the electrophysiology standpoint. And we're really pleased to see that the, these compounds that were safe in the microbrain 3D, like the Enricasan, didn't induce any considerable change in several parameters that we measure using a microbrain 2D in multi electrode array. So this is electrophysiology on the, on the, on the left. So, Changes here uh, in the electrophysiology, they are or uh, towards uh, less frequent, that's going to be uh, more white, or more, more frequent, that's going to be red. So we're, we're looking for compounds that maintain this heat map close to blue. So that's why the control is the first one, and you can see that daptomycin and the ricasin also keep a part of that closely remember to the control. But all the other compounds that were considered safe, um, we, uh, we can see a uh, safe in the cell viability, you can see that there is a functional toxicity. Uh, moreover, you are able to capture that functional toxicity using the microbrain 3D. So the main difference here between the multi electrode arrays and the microbrain 3D is because the throughput of the microbrain 3D being at three to four wells is much higher, especially in combination with the flipper. Uh, you can also see every time that you, set, you see this change, you can now uh, take this change that you observe in the flipper and take this plate and measure uh, more high resolution using the image express confocal. So you can even have a high resolution of that signal that is, um, uh, is inducing some change uh, that you think that's important. So overall, we think that our platform is, is very capable to answer very complex questions like this one and investigate um, uh, 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 very uh, uh, problematic uh, a problem like the Zika virus infection in a very fast way, especially in combination with the, uh, with the uh, platforms for molecular device. So in summary uh, for this webinar, what I hope that I show you today is that the microbrain 3D is a neurospheroid platform composed of mature uh, cortical neurons and astrocytes. So they present highly consistent functional signal between the different wells and make it suitable for high uh screening. Uh, the neural networks are responsive to neurotransmodulators, and we don't need to activate that, uh, that signal. Um, uh, it's, it's a spontaneous signal that arises from the, from the de development of this 3D, that you can modulate with, uh, uh, with the compounds later on. 
and we can use this platform to investigate studies that can be applied at different levels. So uh, immune staining, as I show, cell viability, as I show with the cell viability, and finally functional, that's uh, uh, one of the key aspects uh, of this platform to be used to. So I would like to end my, uh, my talk, just uh, thank you to the Monix team and uh, leaving here some contact information for more, for more information. And with that, I'm going to pass to Oksana that's going to continue to uh, show some of the exciting finds that we have with the collaboration that we have with molecular device. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your introduction. So this is Oksana Sirenko. I am senior scientist at Molecular Devices. So I will be talking about evaluation of neuronal toxicity using stem cell-derived neuronal 3D cultures. So there is increasing need on using complex and biologically relevant, more predictive cell-based assays to screen and evaluate compounds with potential for neurotoxicity. The current methods for neurotoxic evaluation rely mostly on animal models, which have their limitation related to throughput, cost, and relevance to human data. So there is a pressing need for the development of multidimensional screening strategies that could provide improved predictivity and also will allow to facilitate prioritization of chemicals for in vivo testing. There is also very important is requirement for assays to be compatible with the high throughput screening. So the goal of present study was to evaluate feasibility of microbrain 3D mixed neurospheroids for neurotoxicity screening, also to optimize phenotypic readouts for quantitative compound responses, and test a selected set of known neurotoxic compounds. We used fast kinetic fluorescence imaging on the flipper or imaging system to measure patterns and frequencies of the calcium oscillation. Spontaneous oscillation of neural steroids were monitored by changes in intracellular calcium levels with calcium-sensitive dyes. Here you can see control steroid calcium oscillation. We used uh, the assay for optimized for high throughput screening in the 384 well plate. In a typical experiment, we received preplated steroids from stemonix. Then we cultured them for four days and then treated with compound. In this example, you can see the screenshot from the 384 well plate on a flipper. Recordings were done for 10 minutes. You can see control samples and also samples treated with different concentration of drugs. Each well of the 384 plate contains single uniformly sized steroids and generated highly consistent performance across the wells and plates. Neural steroids were exposed to compounds in concentration response for either 60 minutes or 24 hours. The assay allows phenotypic characterization of oscillation profiles by using multiparametric analysis that include the oscillation rate, the frequency, the amplitude, peak width, distance between peaks, as well as peak rate and decay time, and perform irregularities. The analysis is done using ScreenWorks Peak Pro software using for peak analysis. Here we present example of traces of several neuroactive reference compounds that includes non-drugs like lidocaine, lamotrigine, dilantin, and haloperidol. You can see dramatic changes in a, bit, in a peak frequency. You can see decrease in a frequency and also increase in spacing and irregularity. Also, we have tested scent of known neurotoxic compounds, including methylmercury, rotenon, MPP, and barberine chloride. We also observed dose-dependent changes in the readouts, including decrease in the peak rate, amplitude, also changes in the spacing and peak width. 
Changes in a peak frequency and amplitude were also observed with compounds with unknown mode of action, including flame retardants and pesticides. In addition to calcium flux assay, high-content imaging methods were used to gain additional information about morphology and viability. Ferroids were imaged using automated confocal imaging system, the image express microconfocal, with either 10x or 20x objective. The methods for imaging steroids were previously described, but typically this stack of from 10 to 20 images taken, separated by 5 to 10 micron, starting from the bottom of the well and moving up. All individual images can be saved and used for 3D analysis, or analysis can be done using 2D projection image. Here you can see spheroids stained for cytotoxicity assessment. Steroids were stained with calcium AM for viability stain, mitotracker orange for mitochondria potential, and nuclear dye stain first. The analysis for imaging readouts outputs were generated using custom model editor. The analysis first finds steroids as an object, and then, secondly, defines number of live cells, which identify by presence of calcium AM signal, and then, third, identify number of cells with intact mitochondria stain, stained by mitotracker orange. Dead cells could be identified by absence or decrease of calcium AM signal. So here you can see the masks for steroids, also mask for positive cells, live cells stained with red, and negative nuclei stained in blue. So as you can see here, the control spheroid has a strong staining for calcium AM and mitotracker orange, and the one which had decreased viability have decreased number of live cells, and you can quantitate all these changes. In the present study, we characterized kinetic and also confocal imaging methods that are compatible with automated instruments and demonstrated the potential utility of human iPSC-derived 3D neuronal steroids for toxicity screening. Here you can see a list of phenotypic descriptors used for neurotoxicity evaluation. Multi-parameter analysis delivers informative readouts that enable screening for effects of test compounds on neuronal activity and also on cell morphology and viability. We have estimated the percent of variability for those readouts. We used control wells on same plate or different plates, just DMSO samples, and calculated the percent of variability. So for different readouts, this percent of variability presented here for 60 minutes or for 24 hours. As a next step, we use the method to evaluate toxicity effects of compounds from a library of 91 compounds received from National Toxicology Program. The library contains representative examples from different classes of chemicals, including pharmaceutical drugs, pesticides, flame retardants, and polyaromatic hydrocarbon. This work is currently in progress. Here you can see a heat map of the responses for the peak rate, where blue corresponds to decreasing peak rate and red corresponds to increase in oscillation rate. You can see that number of compounds cause significant changes in the peak rate and also in other redoubts. In this example, for a number of pesticides, you can see how compounds can be ranked for their potential toxic effect. In the bottom, you can see highly toxic compounds like permethrin or deltametrin. 
and in the top you can see compounds with less known toxicities. We can calculate effective concentration of the compound effect for different readouts and then we can run compounds for their potential neurotoxic hazard. On this graph you can see uh, effective concentrations for different readouts, so the smallest one presented. And as a, a black triangle, there is effective concentration for corresponding viability effects. So this information can be used for flagging potentially toxic compounds and for prioritization of those for other tests. This method is very suitable for screening of multiple chemicals in the high throughput format. So in a summary, we were able to demonstrate that nearosteroids respond for uh, neurotoxic effects and can be used for evaluation of neurotoxicity of various compounds. And it's very important that assay is amenable for high throughput assay format and can enable customers to do screening of multiple compounds. So I would like to acknowledge our collaborators from the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences for providing this um, set of compounds for testing, and also collaborators from Stemonix and my co-workers from Molecular Devices. Thank you so much for your attention. Please follow up with a question. Thank you, Cassiano Carmeo and Oksana Serenko for your presentations. A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Simply type them into the drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window labeled Ask a Question and click on the Send button. Cassiano and Oksana will answer as many of your questions as time permits. Grisha, you may now begin the Q&A. Hi. Um, thanks, Oksana and Cassiano. Uh, nice talk. Uh, we have a number of questions for Cassiano at Stemonix um, uh, about your um, about your cell models. So, um, what you know? How did you mention exactly how your uh, uh, cell lines are derived and uh, and the benefits of the co-culture system and whether they come from a single uh, cell source or not? How does that work? What are the benefits of that? Thanks, Grisha. So, uh, regarding that question, uh, what we do have, just to to highlight uh, some of uh, some of the features of the product, it is that uh, you have the uh, both the astrocytes and the neurons that incorporate in the microbrain 3D. They're derived from the same cell source, so so the, for the same patient. So we have a one cell line that derives um, uh, both of them. So it's it's a co-differentiation. We don't differentiate and separate. This is co-differentiated in this steroid, and the reason for that is to help the maturation, the crosstalk between these both cell types. Um, and we we start with the same IPS cell line source. You can start with a disease line, or you can start with a, a control cell line. We offer right now control cell lines. You are, we have in our portfolio in the future uh, possible uh, disease cell lines. Uh, regarding the difference between the 2D and 3D, what we have observed in vitro here is that there is a, a faster maturation in 3D regarding, uh, compared to the 2D. So this is not only gene expression and uh, immune staining, but also functional. So we have observed a lot of electrophysiology activity on the 3D uh, with a uh, speed up of this maturation compared for the, with the 2D microbrain. So I think you just touched on two other questions in the list. Uh, uh, somebody asked the question about whether you can get patient-derived uh, microbrain model, and you sort of hinted at that. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Um, yes. Um, at the moment, uh, we have uh, uh, we're offering the control cell line, so this is a known disease cell line. We do have a cell bank with the disease cell lines. Uh, have a, a couple of cell lines that we're starting. Um, we we can offer as, as a custom product in the future. Uh, disease cell lines. Uh, for this, for more information, I would um, um, uh, uh, advise that you guys enter in contact with the contact that I shared, that was David and Ryan uh, from Stemonix, uh, but you can answer that question as well. Okay. And then you mentioned a little bit about 2D and 3D. What's the real application difference between microdate and 3D product and a 2D culture? Okay. So, 
Besides the the, uh, the advantage of the 3D regarding the, the maturation, so we have a faster maturation on, uh, on the 3D compared to the 2D. Uh, the main advantage is the fact that you have a spontaneous oscillation on this, and it's very homogeneous between the wells. So uh, we do observe spontaneous oscillation on 2D as well, but maybe because of the layer of cells that's a little bit more compact, uh, there is more variation from well to well in the 384 well format. While on the microbrain 3D, uh, when you use the, the 384 wells, there is uh, much less variation. Uh, I think as Oksana points a little bit of this coefficient of variation between the wells, uh, and especially the drug response as well. There is a lot of uh, uh, a correlation between the drug response and the less variation on that. Okay. How do, how do people obtain the microbrain 3D product, and is there any difference between uh, uh, people in North America versus international? Yeah, at the moment, these are all pre-plated products. So we ship the cells, the cells are ready to go, basically. Uh, we ship in a hibernation media. So uh, the only requirement it is that we recommend is that the, the, uh, there is a media change when we receive the cells. Uh, these are free floating steroids, so there is a, some special uh, requirements to how to do the media change. We have advice on the IFU and for, for all the steps on these and protocols for, for all the steps for how to do this media change, perform this media change. Uh, we do recommend that there is uh, uh, at least one week of acclimation in the lab before you use the cells. Uh, but in, we already received the cells ready to go. We don't need to thaw or we don't need to, um, uh, to prepare the cells. The plates already have the cells pre-plated and, and ready to go for, for, for the assays. Okay. Uh, this is a question for Oksana. Um, this is a question for Oksana. Um, which readouts are the most reliable to quantify the concentration response effects? So we try to characterize different readouts, and while all of them kind of uh, useful to get more description of the phenotypes and phenotypic responses, so we find that uh, some of them have lower variability and some of them have higher variability. So the example of one which uh, relatively lower variability and more high confidence is uh, uh, peak rate and also the amplitude and peak width. Some other have uh, greater variability either within the well, between wells or between plates and some of them are uh, decay time or distance between peaks. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's two questions for uh, Cassiano here. Um, uh, have you tried the microbrain 3D in other formats like uh, microfluidic or organ or chip devices? We have not at the moment. At the moment, uh, we have uh, uh, only done the 3D4 wall format, uh, free floating. Uh, what we're trying to do is in the future offer products that incorporate even more cell types in this microbrain uh, uh, 3D, like for example, microglia and uh, the BBB layer, so the blood brain barrier. Okay. And have you uh, done any work to examine the uh, excitatory to inhibitory uh, uh, neurons? And if you did so, how did you evaluate that? So the ratio that you have in our, uh, uh, on our microbrain 3D uh, is usually 8 to 9 percent of glutamatergic to 10 to 20 percent of uh, GABAergic. That being said, uh, it's really hard to do uh, uh, immune stains for quantification on these 3D platforms, uh, at least for the whole spheroid. Uh, we can do in the, in the layers as a, uh, on the surface or in the, some layers as I showed in the immune staining. We're working with uh, some uh, 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 protocols to delipidify or to clarify this spheroid and be able to image through the whole spheroid in 3D. Uh, we have quantified this using microbrain 2D. That's the same uh, progenitor uh, cells that you use to the derivation. The only difference is that we grow then in 3D in the microbrain 3D. And the ratio is roughly uh, 80 to 90 percent of the glutamatergic, 10 to 20 percent of the GABAergic. Um, we show some uh, similar tendency in gene expression profile as well. Uh, what we hope to do in the future is do more uh, single cell uh, gene sequence uh, that can answer, help you to answer these questions, all the population that we have in the microbrain 3D. Okay, I want to ask a question, so much of an opinion question, so I'll ask Cassiano first and then Oksana can also answer after you. Uh, do you think this technology will help reduce and replace the use of animals in research and toxicology testing? 
So this was one of the uh, our, our main hopes, and uh, uh, is one of the the things that we target the most. Uh, the fact that uh, we can uh, recapitulate better uh, some of the human brain physiology, uh, the fact that we have these spontaneous oscillations, um, um, uh, we truly believe that we can replace uh, in the future uh, the animal uh, animal model. Um, we, and the main reason is because now you're working with uh, human cells instead of um, animal cells in vitro, right? So it can recapitulate some things that is really hard to recapitulate in, in human animals or cannot uh, model in human animals uh, because of the uniqueness of the human neurons or the human brain, but now may be able to recapitulate that uh, in the animal model. Yeah. And Oksana, your opinion, because you've been working quite a lot on a number of complex models around toxicology, what's your opinion? I believe this is uh, very uh, important to develop systems which would allow to test uh, different toxic compounds in a high throughput scale. And uh, so there are millions of compounds in the environment. There are kind of uh, hundreds of uh, developing drugs on the market. So uh, to test them all comprehensively, it's a very big effort. And so development of assays, which is amenable for high throughput screening, is extremely important. And by doing that, you can not only include more uh, compounds for testing, but also you can prioritize those for uh, further testing. Thanks, Oksana. Uh, question for Cassiano. Over what culture times have you found your data to be stable, for example, experiments only on post day 10 or experiments any day between plating day and 10 to 40, so some stability questions. So we do recommend uh, to the customers when they receive the, the microbrain 3D that they stick to the same time frame. Uh, um, this is, um, uh, is a product that is still in development, in neurodevelopment, it still presents some captures for neurodevelopment. So over time, what you observe is an acceleration of the frequency. So there is a change in the frequency uh, over time. That's why when you receive the product, you already target a window uh, that is more suitable for, for uh, response for neuromodulators. So when you receive the product, these are already mature for some time in your hands, um, and they usually target around eight weeks to 10 weeks uh, for use of these steroids. Uh, there is a couple of customers that ask if they could go longer and what could be effect of that, if they could mimic like uh, 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 instead of weeks, months in vitro, uh, we have done um, uh, some extensive culture in vitro uh, just to validate the product uh, for, for up to 25 weeks. And what we observed was an acceleration of this, uh, this frequency, so meaning that there is also a, a, a more maturity, uh, more uh, gene expression being uh, uh, of the neurotransmitters, of the human uh, brain neurotransmitters there. Um, but we stick mostly to the winds of eight to 10 weeks. Uh, we haven't seen uh, uh, a lot of reproducibility between that. Uh, if uh, for any particular reason you want to use a later time point, uh, that can be done as well, as we have also customers asking for early time points. They want to make very early steps of neurodevelopment as well uh, in the past. So that can, um, can be also as a, a custom product in the future. Yeah. So that's related to another question about, uh, another consistency question. This is about, uh, you purchase a plate today versus next month. So you talked about post-plating consistency, and what about like batch, you know, delivery to delivery uh, consistency? We we do observe a lot of consistency between the between the different plates. Uh, we have a quality control for some um, uh, known uh, neuromodulators uh, that he use uh, to validate our batch, and there is a lot of consistency between that. So. Um, so not only between the wells or between the plates from the, from the same batch, but also between different batches, we do observe a lot of consistency. What we do recommend, what I already highlight, it is to use to the same time point for different ones. So we do not recommend, for example, use an eight weeks at some point and 16 weeks in the other point. So there is uh, some, some uh, room for change uh, on, on that product in the ways that there is a continuous development of that product in vitro, right? So you want to stick, as you do your planar experiments with the neurons uh, and other cell types, usually you stick for one specific time point, we recommend to do the, the same. And if you do that, there is a lot of consistency between the products. Um, any example of uh, mimicking a neurodegenerative disease 
example, chronic low concentration treatment with compounds like glutamate. So you have it, I guess, it looks like the person wants to know if you keep the compound in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We we have not yet yeah. doing uh, um, uh, much work for neurodevelopmental disease um, or, or neurodegenerative disease. Uh, we have um, we're starting some work for neurodevelopmental disease. Uh, one cell line that we have here uh, for for a red syndrome. We will hope to offer offer in the future this. Um, for for in the neurodegenerative regard, we we did some work for seizure gene compounds, um, as uh, I highlight in the presentation. Um, but we're still in the preliminary steps of uh, modeling this in vitro with this model. And, and Oksana, you haven't done any chronic long-term treatment with compounds either, right? Uh, not yet. This is very okay. interesting um, aspect would be for future development. Okay, I looking. I uh, the number of questions are winding down. Um, please uh, continue to submit questions. Um, uh, we'll hang on here for one more minute if there aren't any questions. And um, Well, if there are no more questions, I would like to once again thank Cassiano Carmio and Oksana Serenko for their presentation. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Just a reminder, any questions we did not have time for today will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of the registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand through September of 2018. Labrits will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.